Hi there. In this lecture, we see an amazing game of Tigram Trojan against Leonard Stein, played in the 1961 Soviet Team Cup. Let's have a look. C4 by Tigram Trojan, the English opening. It transposes into the King's Engine defense. And here we see Petrosian's pet system, which he made a kind of career out of, the Petrosian system. Very good success rate with it. It was like years later, people trying to find resources just about against this. But, you know, it still is a very good scorer today. We see Knight BD7, Bishop G5, H6, Bishop H4, A6. So here, the plan is to dissuade Knight B5 from white. The queen wants to unpin without indulging g5, without going in for Petrosian's idea of fixing the pawns on dark squares. The pin, if the, the queen is on, is on, if that knight rather is not pinned with queen e8, without allowing knight b5 hitting c7, then black can think about the usual plan of moving the knight out of the way and then playing for f5. So that's the key point here. Is there a downside to this? Is it a bit slow in some way? It seems as though black wants to, you know, be playing as one usually does for the f5. Uh, we see white casting, queen e8, so unpinning the knight, knight d2, and now we see c5. So black also wants to play prophylaxis against white c5 break. We see d takes c6, actually, b takes. There's a different element cast on this position, which is this c8 bishop. And in particular, it's not even the act of wanting to exchange it off in this particular game example. It's the act of trying to lock it in to the pawn chain, believe it or not. Yeah, slightly different from usual. You see b4, rook b8, a3, bishop b7. The c8 bishop is often an issue in defences in the Queen's Pawn game generally. The bishop really hasn't got too much scope here. So this bishop b7 is interesting, but knight b3, and then look, the knight's heading for this sensitive a5 square. So a5 has been weakened by black's activities. Uh, you know, with, with earlier when black had played b takes c6 there's nothing to kick a knight from a5 that actually is an interesting outpost square in this particular position and one which can torture the uh, a, the, the bishop on b7 which is going to be now on the dreadful looking square a8 for the moment it's not totally locked in uh, we see f3 but now <laughs> Yeah, you might think this is a ridiculous decision, but uh, it seems Stein couldn't really find anything else to do. He's perhaps concerned in this position about d6 pressure building up. And he plays a very, very committal move, d5. <laughs> and uh, we have this bishop being a huge problem now, c5. Also, it has to be noted, there's something rather subtle about this as well, that one doesn't have to, for dear life, keep a pawn on c5 to, to leave the bishop locked in. Sometimes it can be given a temporary reprieve, you know, see the light of day just to close it in again. That's an important fact about this a8 bishop we're about to witness here in some of the variations, actually. For the moment, it just looks like a terrible bishop. It's a very different game strategy um, to other examples in this section. So knight h5. And also, of course, the other thing about c5, it's winning a6. So black's going all out for an attack here. Bishop takes a6, knight f4. Now here, you know, black starts to play, you know, attacking chess, in inverted commas. Bishop f2, f5. We see rook c1 being played. It turns out here, you know what I, I mentioned about temporary reprieve, it seems in this position that knight takes f4 could give the bishop a temporary reprieve, but only to lock it in again after b5, there'll be c6 
if the bishop's locked in again, then it's not really great. It's not really a great gift, you know, temporary liberation for the bishop just to lock it in again. What's well, hugely better here? And if e takes, you know, then e takes d5. And even if the bishop's got this bishop's got activity, White well, can play something like this b5. There's, you know, huge pass pawns here. If black wants to weaken the dark squares like this to win an exchange, it's just an absolutely crushing position with these past pawns guided by the bishop as well and yeah the dark square domination is, is another bonus you know so anyway rook c1 is also a strong move of course after f takes f takes we see knight f6 and now trojan does actually use this idea of the temporary liberation e takes but black dead did not even play this Black played knight six takes d5. If black plays this, the bishop just gets locked in again, c6. And then say knight takes f4, b5. If there's no bishop on this diagonal, the king's safer, there's no coordination on, on g2. White's just getting a big advantage here. So we see knight six takes d5. Knight g4, that nice e4 square. And yeah, it will just be too much to bear on knight coming to e4. Black desperately plays this, but he's giving up d4. And with that, the dark squares are going around this king safety. You know, instead of a bishop being on g7, you know, white will be controlling potentially escape squares uh, if that bishop's exchanged off, which it is now. You know, white. so the black king's safety has been reduced. We see the queen maintaining the pin on f6. And the king helps himself now a bit with king g6. Going to g8, you know, bishop c4, that's nasty. King h8 is still leaving the pin. So this looks ridiculous, but yeah, it tries to solve a problem. Knight c4, we see knight d3. Bit of activity, you think? Maybe. Rook cd1, we see knight d5. The knights look visually a little bit active, but queen c2, the problem is they're a liability because they're on the same diagonal as the king. They're kind of loose in a way. We see knight c7, and it looks as though, hold on, the bishop's just been trapped. What's Petrosian done? <laughs> as he's just plundered. Guess what he plays in this position, if I give you five seconds to pause the video. Okay, just knight d6, yeah. He's going to undermine this knight on d3. Knight takes a6 is played. If king g7, then just bishop takes d3. You know, the knight is liberating the bishop there for bishop playing d3, so that's no good. Sorry, yeah, just, just to show that. King g7 just taking there. Thanks very much. Big position there. And if rook takes f1, knight g takes e4. And, you know, this is murderous. This means like rook f6 potentially, or even worse, knight f6. Discovered check check and knight d7 double check and mate brutal so okay so black takes that bishop but now rook takes f5 weakens black's control of d6 and now knight d takes e4 so there's a potential for rook d6 if the knight moves we see knight a takes b pins the queen to the king so a very very difficult position with this hanging knight on d3 so knight a takes b4 a takes knight takes we see the queen just dropping back maintaining these discover nasty discovery attacks all of this while the bishops remain you know locked in here we see knight d5 if king g7 then actually just knight h5 jack and if here you know queen takes b4 is simple and strong so we see knight d5 rook e1 just maintaining a lot of threats Queen d7, uh, just as an illustration, if a, h5, then knight d6 check, and we're hitting the queen. I'm just going to take the queen. So queen d7, but now knight f6 check is a final crushing blow. Discovered check. It's an absolutely crushing blow. Played to the black king. If king takes f6, can you see how white finishes this? If I give you five seconds. Okay. 
pause video. Knight h5 check, and then the queen coming in for the kill. <laughs> yeah, it, it the final position shows devastation. It shows that. Hold on. Why did the Black King get so weak here? Well, there are different stories preluding this story. The, the, the bishop getting locked in on A8 caused a certain amount of desperation for Black. Because, you know, A6 had dropped off as well. So Black, by attacking, was actually ending up weakening his own king. In fact, even the forcing moves, they all seem to serve to weaken the opponent's own king. So, yes, Petrosian, uh, master of provocation, prophylaxis, general pawn moves. So he's featured a lot in this course for good reason. He's one of my favourite uh, world champions, to be honest. <laughs> Along with, you know, Fischer, Kasparov, Karpov. I mean, they're all my favourites. <laughs> but maybe he's a special favourite. <laughs> he's more instructive, it seems, than usual than a lot of the others quite often, like in this game. So model game, 1961. I hope you're inspired by it as much as me. Okay, it's worth playing over. And it's worth checking out. There are certain game collections online if you want further Petrosian examples. Uh, you know, check out Petrosian versus... Petrosian playing Petrosian system, for example. Okay, for other examples. Thanks very much. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the free sample from my ultimate guide to chess pawn structures where I really enjoyed gaining a lot of insight for myself and sharing with you guys about various different key structures which you should know about, isolated pawns, backward pawns, hanging pawns. I even talk about form pawns and this actually has a mammoth 45 plus hours of video content in this course and you can get it at a discount as well with the standard voucher code, which is on King Crusher TV slash pawns. So I hope you do check out this pawn structure course. It's given me a lot of confidence to know fundamentally what's going on. Helps with, you know, getting a template plan quite easily just based on the pawn structure cues of a chess position. Okay, so I do hope you check that out. Thanks very much.